Good morning, Christians. Welcome to Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church. May God bless you richly as we worship him this morning, the final Sunday in the season of Easter, but also a Sunday we celebrate as Mother's Day. God bless you, mothers, and every other person by extension who has been blessed by motherhood. And I think that includes all of us. God bless you this morning. Our opening hymn as we gather in the presence of God this morning is entitled, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. It's hymn 708. God bless your worship this morning. Amen. Let us rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In his word, God shares with us the message of the law. The law is one of the two main teachings of the Bible. It shows our sins. God says that from the time that we were conceived, we inherit our parents' sin. And it didn't take long for that sin, missing the mark of God's holiness, and those transgressions to show themselves in our thoughts, words, and actions. In the things that we have done that go against God's clear will in Scripture, and the things that God wants us to do but we have not done. Take a moment this morning and think about your life in the ways that you personally have sinned against God, then let's not cover it up. Instead, let's confess those sins to the Lord, knowing that we approach the one true God who is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, 
and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. In God's word, he shares with us the message of the gospel. The gospel is the other, the two main teachings of the Bible. It shows our Savior. God, who is rich in mercy, did not leave us to suffer the punishment of hell. He sent his son Jesus to suffer what our sins deserve in our place. Jesus is our substitute. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He lived a perfect life, one without any sin. Just let that soak in for a moment. He went to the cross to suffer the absolute worst death where the father turned his back on his son because Jesus was suffering for the very sins that you and I have committed. And on Easter Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead to assure us that our sins have been paid for in full and that paradise has been won for us. Amen. Trusting in Jesus, let us, all of us, as God's dearly loved people, join in a passage from the scripture where Jesus beautifully summarizes the message of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let us praise the Lord. His mercy is more. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, 
We remember the day when you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We are at, my friends, the last Sunday in the season of Easter, and our first lesson, our epistle lesson, is appointed from 1 John, where we've been all season, chapter 5 today, verses 1 through 6. St. John explains that everyone born of God does what? Overcomes the world. We read, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love. This is how we know that we love the ch children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our fight, faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Be Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 89, Forever I Will Sing. Psalm 89.
Amen. My friends, let us rise for the reading of our gospel lesson. Gospel lesson is part of Jesus' high priestly prayer. Here Jesus prays for us and enables us through his prayers and power to overcome the world. We read from the Gospel of St. John, the 17th chapter, beginning at verse 11. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full assurance of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. At this time we invite the little ones forward for the children's church. Good morning. I'm so happy to have you guys here with us today. And it's our best day ever because every Sunday reminds us that Jesus died on the cross, but he rose again alive and he loves us and he speaks to us through his word. He died on the cross just like that. <sighs> Mr. Marcus, are you ever... to do it. And I get it. Life is like that. My wife sometimes has me it's instructions on how to put together a very complicated bookshelf, right? And this might be very easy for some people, but I always end up with parts. But according to the instructions right here. He's looking at the instructions and all the parts, and how does his face look? He's kind of he's kind of sad. He's kind of overwhelmed. So what does he do? He picks up a telephone, and he calls, and what does his face do? It smiles, doesn't it? Yeah, he's getting the help he needs. Jesus, in our gospel lesson for today, what does he do? He teaches us to pray, and he prays for you. He prays. For me, he prays for your sister and your mom and your dad and all Christians. He prays for us because he loves us. And he knows life gets hard. And he wants us to pray to him when life gets hard. We don't pick up a phone to pray to Jesus, do we? What do we do? We put our hands together. Today is Mother's Day. It's a wonderful day. It's a day we honor mothers. I believe you do. And I suspect sometime today you're going to tell your mom that you love her. Right? Yes. One more thing you can do. Do you know what else you can do? You can tell your mom that you pray for her. Should we do that together right now? Our right. says, you pray for us, and you tell us when life gets hard, you will walk us through it. You send your Holy Spirit to live with us. We thank you for moms. We thank you for families. We thank you for Jesus who died to take our sins away. And we thank you for the gift of prayer. Help us every day to talk to you because you love us and you want us to. 
All this we pray in Jesus' name with a loud. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up. God bless you. All right. From the mouths of babes. This time we turn our attention to another beautiful Easter hymn. We save this one for last. Jesus Christ, my sure defense, hymn 446. Amen, amen. God's word for our devotion, our meditation, this last Sunday in the season of Easter takes us to a long section of Acts chapter 7. And it has been dreadful on those who put together the pericope and pastors choosing to preach on this text, how to include what verses without making the lesson four and a half pages long. So they've done their best. And we're going to preach on this account before us from Acts chapter 7. Simply for proclaiming Christ, the religious leaders wanted to kill Stephen. Christ used their murderous intent to enable Stephen to overcome this broken world. Let's turn our attention to the text as it stands before us. We read, And the high priest asked Stephen, 
Are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Then we skip down to verse 35. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt, the Red Sea, and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, look, he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Last week, we learned about love, how love is not something that runs out. Love is a choice. Love is an action. Today, the last Sunday of the season of Easter, it's like the Lord is sending us off through these words with an application of that. And so we operate under the theme this morning, Easter Resilience, for the last Sunday of Easter. We need this. Our 21st century American culture does not give us much help with the concept of resilience. Our forebearers generations ago would bear children and bury half of them before they reached the age of 10. They would live well into their 30s and 40s. They lived lives ravaged by plagues and disease and war and starvation. They were resilient. They had to be. But we're rather spoiled. We operate under the assumption that as 21st century Americans, life should be good. We should be safe and well fed. Things should go our way. Parents should not bury their children. Children should not die. We have doctors and hospitals for that. Diseases should all be cured. Life should be good. But if you've lived more than a few years on this planet, in this world, you probably recognize that those truths are not true. And that we, me and you, need what God gives. We need Easter resilience. 
And God gives it to us this day. Through the account of the first Christian martyr, a man named Stephen. Let's consider and meditate upon what Stephen says, what Stephen sees, and finally what Stephen does, because it has application to not just moms, but every one of us in the room today. Stephen was a Christian. He was a teacher. He was a preacher. He was a leader in the early church. But he was also arrested and dragged before the authorities, the religious leaders of his day and age. They pulled him off the street, incarcerated him, and put him on trial. The charges against him were thus, this man speaks against the temple and against the law. So those are the charges. Stephen speaks against the temple and against the law. So Stephen, being his own lawyer, in a sense, stands up and proclaims his defense by means of this three-page sermon. And I pray that you read it, maybe not while I'm speaking, but you could. There are worse things you could do while I speak. But go all Berean on me and read the whole thing. It's important. This is forcing me to summarize somewhat in this account. And sometimes when you read a three-page sermon from your Bible, you might conclude that Stephen is about to get killed, so he's stonewalling, he's stalling, but he is absolutely not. These words, the entire account, are a brilliant and utterly astounding defense of the Christian faith, a confession of Jesus a testimony to the risen Lord, and they teach us how to be like Stephen. And Stephen was resilient. And we've established we need this. So, charge one. This man speaks against the temple. Well, Stephen, in words that I did not read, makes the case that we don't need a temple to meet God. And he says, consider the witnesses. Abraham was in a relationship with God, and God appeared to Abraham without a temple. Joseph, the same thing. Moses, the same thing. And even Isaiah, the prophet, says in chapter 66, as we know it, God does not dwell in buildings built by human hands. All right. We can grant that God is big enough to appear to people in any way he wants to, but the objection that Stephen anticipates goes along this line. Okay, okay. The law, however, prescribes all kinds of sacrifices be made, so we need a temple. And Stephen goes, yeah, but that brings me to point number two, your second charge against me that I am against the law. So speaking of the law, Stephen says the law is very good, but there's one little problem with the law. And it's not with the law, it's with us. And that problem is we never keep it. We never have. We never can. It didn't happen under Moses. Or Aaron. Listen to the prophet Amos. The law is good. Yeah, it is. But we can't keep it. So we have a problem. Outwardly, like you Pharisees out there, you can try. But inwardly, as you do, you know this too, we die. Who could stand in the presence of a holy God? If the judge is on the throne, that is good. That establishes there is law. But if the judge is on the throne, the problem we have is we have not kept the law. And then he steps aside. He gives his by the way. He says, by the way, I noticed something about our people from history, a pattern. You know it too. 
Every time God sends a deliverer, what happens? He is rejected by the people. You rejected Joseph. You rejected Moses. The people rejected David. Whenever God sends somebody to deliver his people, the people reject the one God sends. Now, look with me at verse 51 and 53, and then we'll go to 52. 51 says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Verse 53 You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. And now we'll go to the verse in between. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? You even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. Who is the righteous one? Jesus. So we're going to take a second reset our minds. I'm asking you to come up with a name for Jesus. There are hundreds. Give me a name of Jesus. I can't hear you, so I can't repeat them all. But Redeemer. Redeemer. Savior. Good Shepherd. Lord. King of Kings. Son of God, Son of Man, the way, the truth, the life. Abba, we call him, Father. Are there others? Yahweh, Emmanuel, God with us. There are tons of them, right? The righteous one is not one that leaps to the top of the deck, is it? This is kind of an unusual term that Stephen uses for Jesus. He could have used any of the ones you listed and about 50 or 60 other ones, and we would know who he's speaking of, but he refers to the one who predicted the righteous one, and the righteous one is Jesus, the one they rejected and killed on a cross. Why would this man use that term, the righteous one? Well, right over here, just that way, there's red light. I think you've all experienced it, right? There are a couple different ways you can handle that red light. You can obey it or disregard it. I recommend the first. But even if you ignore it and run through it at peril to your own life and the life of of others, there is a way you can deal with that. You will get pulled over. You will be issued a ticket, and you can pay it off. There is a means, a mechanism by which you can satisfy the law for breaking or disregarding the red light right out there. Or you could keep it. Stephen just said we can't keep it, but there is the righteous one. The righteous one is the one that Moses predicted and prophesied concerning, and so did Isaiah in about a thousand different places, and David throughout the Psalms, the one who would come, who would obey the law perfectly in our place. Jesus, the righteous one, obeyed the law. But not only that, he paid off the debt for us. For who? Me and you. The times that we have broken God's law again and again by thought, word, or deed, we confessed it moments ago, he, the righteous one, paid my debt and yours on the cross. He paid our debt. It's interesting to note, as you study through this account, you scratch your head and you go, there's really nothing like this in Scripture. I mean, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is long. But this is a big, long text. And John, sorry, Luke, who God used to, inspire, or to write these inspired words that the Holy Spirit gave him, was also the one who God used 
eyewitnesses to fuel the accounts that Luke, by the Holy Spirit, put before us a miracle too big for my head. But where do we get this long account of Stephen's defense before his stoning? Who would you say kept notes? The Holy Spirit could have just pipelined this in. But I think it was the man holding and watching over the coats. The young man, Saul, who we know better after his conversion as Paul. And I'm being very careful. I don't want to say more than Scripture says, but I can almost imagine this Saul, who was the closest that we could come to as a lawyer, was taking notes on Stephen's defense with the hope that he would have the opportunity to defend the truth of his God against the false lies of the Christian. But that young monk, Saul, if he was taking notes, and we know he was there, would have been completely unarmed by the sound logic and reasoning of this defense that is made by Stephen. But if he's blown away by that, he was even more blown away by what follows. This are words that Stephen said, but consider before us what Stephen sees. Scripture told us our lesson echoed it that his face became like that of an angel and he was not afraid to stand before a hostile group of people who would later have stones in their hands and to speak truth to power, so to speak, to call them a brood of vipers. And then he says, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man, what? what? What's the Son of Man doing? Sitting at the right hand of God? Somebody catch it? No, he's standing there. And why is Jesus standing at the right hand of God? The right hand of God is God's courtroom. Jesus is standing, confessing Stephen before the Father, even as Stephen is standing and confessing Jesus before those who reject him. While well, Stephen was confessing Jesus before men, Christ was confessing Stephen before God. And there is the key to Easter resilience. It's right there. 1 John chapter 2 says... We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. There's that term again. In Jesus, the righteous one, when the Father looks at me and he looks at you, what does he see? He sees Jesus' perfect record paid in full. Our sins are gone. As we sang today, he remembers them no more. God is faithful, and God is just. We confess that the absolution today. Faithful, he keeps his promises. He sent his son to die on the cross, and just because Christ paid for every sin that we dragged into this building today, that means they are forgiven because they have been paid for once by the righteous one, the one who committed no sin but took upon himself the sin of the nation your sins are paid for, and that makes God just. He forgives you because Christ paid them. And if Christ paid for them, you cannot be charged twice. Now consider this. This defense reminds me of the paper towel commercial bounty being thrown into a pool of liquid Bounty is so absorbent, it sucks it all up into itself, right? 
this man, Stephen, was so full of the words of Jesus that when the stones were hitting his head and his side and his feet, what came out of his mouth? Father, forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. I see my Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. These are all the words of Jesus. Why? Because the rocks were knocking out of his body and his mouth what his mind and heart were filled with, namely the words of Jesus was who he was. What resilience. Are we filled with the words of Jesus? Do you see every day God standing at the Father's right hand, Jesus standing at the Father's right hand for you, saying, mine, forgiven, love. Not only was Saul, later Paul, shocked by what Stephen said, but he must have been utterly shocked by what he saw Stephen endure and how he faced suffering people do not die like this. Very few, only those who have resilience beyond most people. And we can have that same resilience, too. So let's close this out. I'm talking too long. What Stephen does. What does he do? Simply, he suffers and he dies. He suffers and how he faced suffering does help us deal with the suffering that we face in every age. Stephen does, yes, suffer and die. And this had a huge effect on Saul we know him better as Paul. And his death finally did what? It accomplished moving the church of God out of its parents' basement once and for all. I don't know if anybody here has the kids living in the basement still, but there comes a time when it's time to get out. Jesus said to his church, go to all the nations of the earth, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, but they were all sitting there in the basement back in Jerusalem, uh, the persecution that ensued after those people so filled with hatred picked up the stones and took the life of Stephen, forced the Christians out where God wanted them to be. But not without the report and the account of their brother who stood up to those who hated them with courage and boldness, filled with the Spirit, who now is with Christ in heaven. And that, my friends, is Easter resilience. I can't know what you face this week. I can't know all that you are up against in your life. I can't know what difficulties and persecution you face. I can't know what heartbreak and loss is yours even as you sit in the pew. I can't know it, but I can know this. We have a resilience from God, like Stephen, as we fill ourselves with his word and promise, his supper, reminded of our baptism, day after day that fills our hearts with this inexhaustible power and love to give us Easter resilience. God grant it to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now the peace of God that transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in him until life everlasting. Let this account and this defense of our brother Stephen, who we will see again, roll over us and strengthen us for the days ahead as we continue with our musical offering.
prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Accept these gifts, Lord, and use them to reach others with the message of Christ crucified and risen. Amen. At this time, my dear friends, I invite you to rise and join me as we make confession of our Christian faith, together with Christians the world over, going back centuries upon centuries. Let us throw our confession before the world and one another with the words of the Apostles' Creed printed on page 9. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you created Adam and Eve for each other and gave them children. We praise you for the blessing that you give to us through families. We praise you on this Mother's Day for the gift of mothers. We thank you for protection and shelter and food and clothing, love, support, and guidance and education and especially the opportunities to share with one another the true and saving faith. You, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in a way, are one God, yet three persons, the most beautiful existence of love in community and unity that goes beyond our ability to describe, but you created us to bring us into the love. We thank you for families who have brought others into the love that exists imperfectly in their midst. But when we look back at the gift that you have given, we see your son, we see our forgiveness, and we see so many other gifts that you give to us that radiate from that ultimate gift, and one is the gift of motherhood. We thank you for the mothers you have used and employed to bless us. Yes, we remember our sins of anger and our grudges and our violence and our disobedience and the harsh words, those fights, the unloving actions towards members we love in our families. And we're ashamed of these. But we hear today that there is one that stands, yes, stands at the right hand of the Father, confessing us before you. For you are not only faithful, but just and you have taken our sins away. Help us to forgive others who have hurt us. Give us patience and understanding. Fueled by your grace, fill us with love in all our family interactions. Give us joy and delight in our homes and relationships. Help fathers and mothers provide not only for the physical and material needs of children, but also for their emotional and their spiritual needs. Use us to feed your lambs. Lord, on this day, we pray for Sue's son-in-law and daughter. You have saw fit to take Sue's son-in-law, Ben, from this world. He passed this week. We pray that you comfort and strengthen Linda as she grieves and bless the family as they go forward. Hold before them the hope of the resurrection of Christ and the message of salvation through you. We pray, Lord, for Ken, who is recovering now from surgery on Friday. We pray that you bless his recovery and grant him healing and strength in the days ahead. Bless his family and his loved ones, encourage and strengthen them and hold them up. And we thank you and ask you to bless our mothers. The lead 
us, Lord, to be grateful for your gifts and to not take them for granted. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you this day our private petitions. Others are tough and resilient. They have to be so often, but we need more, Lord, all of us. Make us, Stephen, tough and resilient. Help us to see before our eyes you standing before us, commending us because of your amazing grace and mercy. Help us to see you there day in and day out that we may face whatever troubles come our way with the same confidence that our brother Stephen did. We thank you for making us members with him of your family of believers through baptism. Help us to live as your children, secure us in your love, and we ask it in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out, yes, pour out the Holy Spirit on your people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Let's close. I see I went long today. I'm sorry. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, hymn 839. Let's rise for the final stanza and greet one another thereafter. Hymn 839.